I'm just trying to sort out my screen. I think that'll do. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, Dom, thank you very much for asking me to uh, contribute to this evening's session. Um, we've got two amazing speakers to follow me, and if I can set the scene in any way possible, that would be an absolute privilege uh, and honour. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the philosophy that we've developed at St George's over the years around bone loss. And really, um, it's really interesting to update this talk, having given it two or three times over the years. Um, you know, where are we in 2022? I'm a revision hip and knee surgeon um, at St George's Hospital London. I do work at Swellyock as well, um, and my revision practice is in both units. In terms of uh, disclosures, I think it is important to get some disclosures uh, out because they are relevant in many ways. But firstly, just thanks to uh, my colleagues, because um, without them, this talk would not be possible. Simon Bridle and I really started the complex arthroplasty unit at St. George's about 20, 22 years ago. And uh, Simon has now left uh, St. George's, but we've been joined by two fantastic colleagues, Suleiman Alazawi and John Stammers. And this talk represents the evolution of the ideas that the four of us have developed and continue to develop, develop going forwards. So in terms of my disclosures, I, I do receive some educational uh, fees from Stryker for talking at uh, Revision Symposia. In the past, I've done similar work with Smith & Nephew, Worldmire Link, Finsbury Orthopaedics, who became Matt Ortho, uh, and Lima. It's important to declare that, I think, at the moment, and John Stammers. Also importantly, um, I don't have any conflict of interest around implant design or development work right now. And consequently, I don't think any of those disclosures are relevant to this talk. I also think it's important for you to understand uh, what my work courses are in revision, because, of course, when we talk about our own experience and our own ideas, they're largely born out of the implants that we use routinely. Um, my workhorse on the femoral side is the restoration modular system from Stryker. Um, my hemispherical socket reconstructions are usually with a Stryker product, usually in the Trident line. When I need to go to augment some more complex reconstruction, I'm using the Zimmer trabecular metal system. I'll discuss why and how uh, later. My personal custom shell experience has almost entirely been with Lima, have a small experience with the custom shells from World My Link and Stanmore. On the proximal femoral replacement side, I've used the striker system. Total femurs, I use the World My Link because I like the knee uh, mechanism that goes with that. And in my career, I've never used uh, a locking stem for femoral reconstruction. So having set that scene for my talk, where are we in 2022? Well, I think the first thing to say is that when I was in Vancouver with Dominic, and certainly for the first five to seven years of practice at St. George's, we had massive bone loss on an almost daily basis. And I think in 2022, heroic salvage for massive bone loss, bone loss is much less common. There are multiple reasons for that. I think we're using better primary implants now, certainly with better polyethylene. Uh, we're performing less uh, destructive minimally invasive surgery that was a great generator of massive bone loss paradoxically in the early years and in the revision surgery we've got better instrumentation so we're less likely to cause massive bone loss I think we're better at doing revision surgery we're more familiar with team working and we're better educated thanks to uh, programs such as this put together by Vikas so I think we just understand revision surgery better um, and we're just performing better primary surgery as well. So th this massive bone loss is not as common as it once was. And also, I think as hip surgeons, we're got, we've got a lot more familiar with the custom acetabular components. And many more of us than certainly when I was in training are, are, are more familiar with the, uh, the proximal femoral replacement option. And these are not the go-to implants in every case, but... I think we are just a bit more akin to using these in 2022, certainly than we were in 2012, and most definitely in 2002 when I became a consultant. So it's no surprise that the two guys, experts we're about to hear from, 
um, uh, in terms of massive bone loss are tumor surgeons. Because if we want to talk about massive bone loss, I think we have to look to the tumor uh, world for, for the sort of current experience, really. And add to that the infection and the periprosthetic fracture world. That, that, those are the areas, really, I think now where we're seeing very significant bone loss. So what about the St. George's algorithms around massive bone loss in revision hip surgery? Before I talk about uh, where we are in terms of reconstructive options, we just uh, lay the groundwork, really. What do I think about investigations of value around bone loss? Well, I think the CT scan uh, is, is arguably the most important uh, assessment after the plain x-rays in terms of looking for bone loss and mapping it out. I think the MRI scan is much less valuable. I think around uh, soft tissue abnormalities, perhaps uh, adverse reaction to metal debris, it still has a place. But in terms of planning the bone loss side of things, I'm not sure the MRI is particularly important. And we'll say this time and time again, but we must never forget when there's bone loss, is it infected? And our workup would, would centre around the history, examination, the routine inflammatory markers, a 14-day aspirate with a neutrophil count, and in, in selected cases, uh, either an alpha defensin or a, a leukocyte esterase strip. And then we move on to the sort of fundamental rules for success when we're dealing with bone loss. And I think we have to start with effective classification systems. And for me, this would be a, a paproski on both sides of the joint, really. I know that the acetabular system is, is complex, but if we're dealing with significant amounts of bone loss, we have to be able to grasp and deal with complex uh, classification systems. And I, I must say, I do find this a really uh, workhorse classification system, both in how I look at x-rays, how I think about surgery in my head, and also how I talk to, to my colleagues about um, cases that we're planning together or might even do together. And similarly, on the femoral side, I mean, it, it's much less difficult to remember because it's, I think, much more commonsensical. But it's certainly in terms of um, where the bone might be available for fixation. It, it's, a, it's a very usable uh, classification technique. And I think what we need to appreciate here is that when we're dealing with significant bone loss, we're getting close to last chance saloon surgery. And what none of us want to do is end up in the operating theatre with a scenario that we just thought might uh, be suitable for a certain uh, implant or technique, and then to find to our surprise that we don't have the implant that we need or the reconstructive technique that we need because we hadn't anticipated it. That is the ultimate disaster and one that we really all need to strive to avoid. And I think these uh, classification systems will help us do that. So what questions do I ask myself on the socket? Do I have a supportive rim? Can I manage with one or two augments? Do I need column support? Do I have pelvic discontinuity? And then just a little bit about what is the patient's biology, and I'll, I'll enlarge upon that in a moment. In terms of the rim, um, I think if we do have a supportive rim, then for me, any, hem hem any hemispherical cup will do. I don't think you need a particularly special hemispherical cup. I've used the the PSL Trident in many, many revisions with a supportive rim with fantastic results. Um, within that supportive rim, if there are contained defects, then we're going to graft those. But if, if the rim isn't um, supportive, then we've always got the option of impatch and bow grafting, closing the rim with bone and, and impatch and grafting a socket in. In terms of do I need augments, um, I make no uh, apology for pushing the trabecular metal system. I'll explain why uh, momentarily. Um, it's been the uh, augment system that I've stuck with. I know they were the sort of first to the market, really. And, and now every company seems to have a system of augments, most of which are more usually user friendly. But the reason I've stuck with this is this. I mean, I, th I think the biomechanics of our reconstructions in the socket are really important. And if we think about the, uh, the Young's modulus of our reconstruction and how the bone might remodel about, uh, around something that we're going to put in there, if you add a, a, tantal, a, purely, a completely trabecular tantalum augment or shell with cement and a polyethylene liner, the Young's modulus of that reconstruction is essentially the same as bone. And we've seen amazing bone remodeling, and that, that's really why I've stuck with um, this system. Here's a 15-year x-ray of a very complex acetabular reconstruction in a gentleman with ankylosing spondylitis. And 
you can see that the bone has just accepted that and, and treats this implant as bone. And this has been our, our, our uniform experience of favourable remodelling around these uh, tantalum implants and pu pure tantalum, not the shell with a locking mechanism, but the pure tantalum shell. Do I need column support? Um, I mean, column support was extremely challenging because the shims and the shim augments and the column augments were really, really difficult to use. And I think this is one of the areas where the, um, the custom implants are really coming into their own. What about discontinuity? I'd just like to introduce two ideas to you. Uh, this is the stiff and the flexible discontinuity because I think they need to be treated differently. If you see a discontinuity like this where there really is um, no uh, uh, pubic ramus fractures and no real distraction, uh, sorry, uh, 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 migration of the, of the discontinuity, then I think that is distractible and can be treated uh, in the way that uh, Wayne Poprosky described with a, with a large shell plus or minus augments. But if you see these pubic ramus fractures down here and or in the superior pubic ramus, that's not distractible. If that's a flexible discontinuity, and if you try and distract it, it'll just keep on going and going and going. You need to reduce and fix that and then reconstruct it with whatever you think is uh, appropriate. For me, that would be a tantalum shell. So uh, then the, the discontinuity with massive bone loss, I think we'll hear a lot about that from, uh, from Matthew and, and, and Duncan. But um, for me, that's ignore and stem fixation with a cone implant or reduce, fix and replace with a custom shell. And I, I, that for me, that the, the custom shells have just really transformed my experience with the, um, the, the discontinuity with massive bone loss. A little bit about the biology. Well, other places where impacting bone grafting perhaps isn't a good idea, and I'm happy to be to get into a discussion about this, but I don't think they're a good idea for the 3A or 3B defects unless you're going to use augments to close it down. And the patients on anti-metabolites post-radiotherapy are nervous after metal-on-metal -metal reaction. I don't think it's a good idea for one stage for infection. And then metastatic disease. I think there is still a role and and the support rings would be sort of my workhorse in metastatic disease. On the femoral side, the questions are, am I replacing bone within the bone? Am I replacing missing bone with metal? Or am I replacing the whole bone? I think bone within the bone on the femoral side is pretty predictable with impacts and grafting. I don't think this is a difficult technique. And I think most of us can achieve good results with this, but we must obey some fundamental rules. And you know, in my hands, I've got it wrong from time to time. I haven't always understood the biology, the pathology or underlying causes, but on the whole, had really very satisfying results with impatching bone grafting on the femur. If I'm replacing missing bone with metal, then I'm either going to use a monolithic stem like this or a modular stem like this. I'm not very keen on the, uh, the, the monolithic stems. I don't think many of us are using these solution type stems anymore. But the, the Wagner type stems, I know I've got a lot of fans and we can certainly get into discussion on this. But for me, I just like the versatility of the, of the modular stems. I don't see any problems with the modern tapers. And now I can go for maximum proximal support as well as distal support and just deal with so many more situations with a modular stem. In terms of the ETO with the taper fluted stem, I don't have a big problem with the length of the ETO. My longest is 30 centimetres. That was sadly associated with a medial fracture, which healed. But the medial corticotomy, as we see here, will always give us the opportunity to correct various remodelling. What about replacing the whole bone? Well, I think it's predictable. It's quicker than some of the more complex reconstructions. I think arguably it's less complex. The rehab is easier. And I've got a very low threshold for this in the end, elderly. Uh, particularly, and as we might hear from uh, Duncan, who I know talks about some improvements in the junction between the implant and the bone. And I think that might make these things even more attractive as time goes on. So in terms of massive femoral bone loss, I think we should plan for it, know it's going to happen, have some vascular help around in case we need it, and work in teams. I'll come back to this time and time again. Here is Simon Bridal on the left and me on the right and a fellow in the background working on both sides of the bone, looking for the vessels, dealing with them as they start bleeding, and then later on in the operation, um, building the implant. It just speeds things up, helps with decision-making, 
And when one person starts to get tired or overstressed, the next one takes over. Combined massive bone loss, I think sometimes this is inevitable. Uh, this lady, 46 years of age, came to see me just for a checkup, actually. Um, and really to, to uh, get that as a center of rotation on the, um, the socket anywhere near the right place, that stem's fully ingrown and will have to come out. There's no way the soft tissues, particularly the cytic nerve, will take the stretch. So resection of the proximal femur may be essential in terms of getting the length right, the center of rotation right, the biomechanics acceptable, and of course, improving the exposure. And just finally, and very quickly, some thoughts about the surgery itself. These patients have multiple scars. They have adherent layers. The surgery is associated with high stress levels. It takes a long time. There's high risk of complications. It bleeds a lot sometimes. But I think if you stick to the basic surgical principles, don't deviate with the, from them just because it might be a salvage operation. You'll be on to a winner. So here we go through the layers. There's the skin, the fat down to the fascia lata. Develop the fascia lata in the way that you normally would in a revision. Then the tumour and the bone loss underneath that will come into view. For me, the starting point of all revision surgery is the sciatic nerve. And I won't progress until I've identified the sciatic nerve because I know then I can work in front of that very safely. Tag the soft tissues for repair at the end, do whatever we need to do. And don't particular small incisions, meaning that our newer implants get dragged in through the skin on the way in. You can repair them at the end. You know you haven't damaged the sciatic nerve. And, and, and really, those layers on the way out um, will be a biological barrier to infection um, after surgery. So I mean, even in the most complex of situations like this, where you've got everything and the kitchen sink inside the patient, as long as you pay attention to developing layers, careful hemostasis, and preservation of the uh, vital structures, I think with a satisfactory and sound algorithmic approach, never under, under, underestimate the importance of working in teams. You can get good and predictable results even in the most complex of situations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Phil. That's a great review of the situation, um, which could be facing a nice um, idea of your protocol. It's now my pleasure to ask if Michael Parry will uh, give a presentation. Um, Michael qualified from Bristol, combined with Oxford and Southeast uh, rotation. Uh, having completed a doctorate in 2012, he was then appointed at the Royal uh, Orthopaedic Hospital in 2014. Um, he does a lot of orthopaedic oncology and infection management, uh, and he's published widely on this. So I think he's got a huge experience that will be able to uh, lend to us about um, uh, revision surgery in these cases. Uh, Michael, I know your camera's maybe not working, but we'll, hopefully you'll be able to present your talk. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dominic. Um, can you hear me all right? Good. Right. And you should be able to see this, I hope. I do apologise. I'm, I'm possibly the most technologically inept person in the world, so I'm sorry that I've not been able to get this work to work. Um, thank you very much uh, for asking me to give a little bit of insights. We, the, the way we were, we've sort of structured this, I think, is that um, Phil's obviously given you the, the overview of the sort of grand plan and management and my remit was to sort of talk about uh, particularly the acetabular side um, bone loss. Um, and I think Duncan's going to concentrate a bit more on the femur um, after me. Um, so uh, my, my background, is, is, as Dominic says, is principally in, in oncology, but I also did the Vancouver uh, Arsoplasty Fellowship. Um, gosh, feels like a long time ago now. So my, my principal background is in, is in revision arsoplasty. Um, but obviously, there's, there's an awful lot of translation between the two specialities of orthopedic oncology and revision arthroplasty. Um, and it's quite refreshing to see, I think, um, for Duncan and I, that, that a lot of the techniques and, and um, implants and, and devices that we've relied upon for our workhorse reconstructions over the years uh, following massive bone loss for tumours have now found their way into, into orthopedic practice as a whole revision arthroplasty and it's sort of testament to what we've done and our, our those that went before us the sort of great innovators in years gone by um, what they set out to achieve 
um, that these implants are now getting more and more uh, traction in, in, in more conventional uh, arthroplasty, uh, non-oncology um, uh, scenarios. Um, so what are we talking about? Well, really, it's this, it, it, Phil's touched on it already. It's sort of the unpredictable nature of what we do. Um, and, and it's quite refreshing to see other people say, you know, if you take your eye off the ball, it, it does come out, come up and bite you quite quickly. Um, so having, having the, the, the full shelf, the full toolkit of what you need, um, particularly in an oncology setting, but, but very much so in a revision arthroplasty setting, um, I think is, is absolutely um, of paramount importance. And one thing I would have added to Phil's talk is to just make sure you've got the toolbox behind you. Um, it's all too easy to find yourself in a situation of an unpredictable scenario without a, a, a reliable get out of jail clause. And of course, the, 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 uh, the, the oncology surgeon in me would always say that you, it's always nice to have a plan A. It's quite refreshing to have a plan B. But never underestimate the, the value of a plan C, D, E, F, and all the way sometimes up to the midpoints of the alphabet, because it can be incredibly unpredictable. And I used to think when I was a younger man that the unpredictability demonstrated the naivety of use. But actually, I think as I've got a bit older, it, it, it's, it possibly presents a slightly more balanced approach to the, predicting things that are, are slightly less predictable, I suppose. Uh, so we were talking about the the acetabular bone loss. I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is um, fills in a lovely overview of of of, of the, the the key points to remember. And I'm just going to sort of show you a few, hopefully a few interesting cases, which aren't too boring, I suppose. But um, just to demonstrate what we what we come across sort of day in day out. Some of this is oncology, some of it's revision arthroplasty, and some of it actually is primary arthroplasty as well. So the causes and classifications, the, 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 the Proposky classification, those of us that did any time in North America will be sort of have this drummed into us. Um, and it's, it really is very reliable and reproducible. Um, what we're talking about, I think, the majority of the time are the 3A, 3B defects, which sort of give you the willies a bit and scare you uh, the most. The, the lesser ones down towards the lower end of the scale are, are often quite manageable with um, conventional primary arthroplasty um, uh, implants uh, on the acetabular side. And the causes of bone loss, and this is all sort of the basics, it's the congenital and the, the acquired causes. Um, what we principally talk about is, is revision arthroplasty, and I agree with Phil, actually, I'm, I'm seeing an awful lot less um, significant periacetabular loss for, for non-oncology causes now than, than certainly I used to see when I was on fellowship and when I first started here. Infection, however, it remains a big problem and is, is an increasing problem, I think. Um, and maybe we've traded one enemy for another. Um, but of course, it is a rising problem um, in the population. Tumour, both primary, principally primary malignant bone tumour, um, will, by the very nature of the disease, lend itself to massive bone loss, and it's having the mechanism of reconstruction of that. And, of course, the, the Proposky classification doesn't really apply to that, but the principles are the same. Metastatic bone disease is in, increasing, um, and I think allied to that is the, the, the improvements in survival for patients with metastatic bone disease, which means that more of these, more patients with... Uh, metastatic bone disease are living for longer, which means your reconstruction just needs to be that much better, that much durable, um, because it, the, the principle is very much the same. It has to outlive the patient. And if the patient's living longer, your reconstruction needs to live as long, at least as long as they do. Metabolic bone disease, again, not so much of an issue um, uh, in my practice, but we do see a few weird and wonderful funky things that give you quite significant bone loss or poor quality of the bone that remains um, and obviously is, is within the differential. The options for reconstruction obviously depends very much on the size and location of the defect. Um, uh, the advent of, of modern um, revision cup systems. Um, I don't have a particular favourite, I have to say. It's sort of horses for courses, but um, and the jumbo cups for, can, and, 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 and TM cups can fill pretty much most defects um, with or without the addition of something else on the backside, be that an augmental cement or um, some sort of allograft or autograft from the patient themselves. 
Um, moving up the complexity ladder for the central defects using a cage, I have to say I've, I've fallen out of favour. They've fallen out of favour in my practice a bit, largely because um, I think they're a bit fiddly, they're a bit unpredictable, and probably not good enough at using them to make them reliable. And largely because pedestal cups, I think for for for, for pelvic tumor surgery, have largely replaced sort of um, cages, cup cage constructs. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a, an ice cream cone type prosthesis, a pedestal cup can do as much uh, as, a, as a cup cage. And, and in, in my hands, I think it's, it's probably slightly easier to put in. I mean, this is the sort of fairly straightforward um, case. Uh, the principle is, I mean, this is a... a relatively fit and alcoholic um, avascular necrosis, which has been around for a long time, about as long as his drinking problem, um, but it, now nice and dry, but effectively has a, a superiorly translated hip. And the principle is to get the hip centre down and reconstruct the defect. Um, and that's the sort of thing that that's now um, six years down the line. It's the sort of thing that, that actually does very well with a, with an augment, bring the hip centre back down, restore leg length. Um, it needed very, very well indeed. Um, and, and that, in, I think, is a nice, is a really nice, straightforward, it's a really good fun thing to do. Um, and it's nice and reliable. Uh, we see less and less of this now. These are the, the sort of typical um, either Percy's or DDH's that, that, that we used to see. Um, and I certainly see, see fewer of these now. Um, but the principle is the same, um, significant uh, dysplasia and, and um, not really bone loss, but a, a, a sort of a defect for a, a challenge for, for acetabular reconstruction. And this was a sort of early one from my practice. I used to, be, used to quite enjoy using um, either autograft or allograft, recon, autograft or allograft reconstructions for, for supralateral defects. And they did, they, they often did quite well if they didn't get infection, infection, it didn't get infected. Infection was always a, a bit of a problem. Um, this is a slightly more uh, challenging um, situation. So this is the, the Proposky 3B. So this is an acute presentation. Again, a native hit, not, not revision, but 85-year-old lady who um, fit and well, lived out in Hereford. For those of you that don't know, it's farming country. They, they build them bloody strong over there. Um, but she effectively fell off a, a, a fence, broke her uh, acetabulum, and they effectively wrote her off, said, it'll be all right, it'll gum up, don't worry, you'll be up and walking in six weeks. Well, she started walking in six weeks, of course, and the whole lot then falls apart. Now, the, it's not really bone loss per se, but the principle of how you treat it is, I think, is exactly the same. Um, and in hers, and this is now, again, it's about five years down the line, um, effectively um, bone grafted the backside, stressed it, you know, it's a pelvic discontinuity, um, a, a, a stretchable uh, discontinuity. So you can use a, a jumbo cup to give you a good fixation. She did very well indeed. The chronic ones are slightly more difficult. Um, so this is a 52-year-old lady. We see an awful lot of this here in Birmingham, as you might suspect. Um, so metal on metal, adverse reaction to metal debris, large periacetabular uh, defect um, with a painful hips as a BHR done about 10, 15 years ago, massive pseudo tumor on the inside of the pelvis, needed a quite an extensile approach. We, we tend to try and take the, the defect, take the... Um, uh, the pseudo tumor out, um, and we've sort of tailored our approaches to allow us to get on the inside and the outside of the pelvis, even for the for the revision arthroplasty. She did very well with a with a, so a semi constrained defect. Um, did well with bone grafting um, and, a, and a cage. Having said, I don't really do cup cages. So this is now six months. Bone graft starts to integrate, and um, she did very well indeed. Um, the big central defects, so a lovely case of, of, um, of a bit of a funky central defect. We, we see, we do still occasionally see these. We often use bipolar heads in the younger patients for the proximal femoral replacements. And over time, of course, they migrate through the pelvis if you, if you don't keep an eye on them. Interesting, what you find is that you, it looks like the whole thing's sticking into the pelvis. You often get this sort of neoacetabulum, a nice sort of corticated um, floor, which you can often use to build something off um, and in his case revised his proximal femur that was loose um, big augment that looks like it's floating in the breeze but actually that's buttressed up against um, very nice bone and again four years later like Phil said that sort of integrates itself beautifully um, and he carries on functioning extremely well indeed 
Um, I'll go through a, a few examples uh, just to, to sort of illustrate some of the things that we see. So this is a 25-year-old guy with a um, uh, spindle cell sarcoma of bone. You can see the defect in his um, in a table, of course. Uh, sorry, in his um, superior and inferior pubic ramus, MRI demonstrates quite an extensive tumour going all the way up to the anterior column of his pelvis. But actually, you can you can use these TM effectively a, a primary or, or straightforward revision uh, TM cup to reconstruct that sort of defect with relatively little bone contact, surprisingly little bone contact. Um, and this is now about four or five years down the line, cancer-free, functions extremely well. Um, and that thing is now fully integrated. Um, so we, we always used to say sort of about 50% contact on the cup to give you integration. I think you could probably start stressing that a little bit more. And certainly we found um, even with very, very small contact areas, um, you can get these cups to, to stick quite nicely. Um, this is a 62-year-old gentleman, high-grade chondrosarcoma of his pelvis. Um, so this underwent so it's effectively a P2P3, so periacetabulum and, 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 and pubic resection. Um, and complementing the, the, the pedestal cup, quite a short stem fixation on the pedestal cup. And we found that's about the limit of what you can get in the posterior ilium, about five centimetres of bone cover in the ilium. Um, and have augmented that with shims on the front and the back of the pelvis. And of course, this is actually quite straightforward because the whole thing's open in front of you. You can see the D, you know, you can see the inner table and the outer sober of the pelvis. So using these as buttresses to support the cup. Um, he's still quite early on, but he's functioning very well. He's gone back up north to Sheffield. Um, so, so it, it's sort of using the, the, the arthroplasty principles of, of, of shims and supports to augment the more sort of conventional oncology reconstructions. Um, this is a sort of case in point. I just I put this in just to sort of highlight the issues. This is a 45 year old gentleman. He's, this is only, only, I've only done about six operations in my life. There's only six patients I can remember, but he's certainly one of them. He walked into my clinic with his heavily pregnant wife with, um, with a painful left hip. And you can see there's a big defect on the back of the um, acetabulum. I'm not surprised he had painful hip. But anyway, his wife was quite heavily pregnant at the time um, to the point where when he came in for his biopsy, she went into labor. He got shipped up the road to the women's hospital, squeezed the baby out, and then came back and had a biopsy uh, and, and finished his biopsy um, and confirmed this to be a plasma cytoma. So not a primary malignant bone tumor, but, but effectively um, malignancy is the acetabulum. And you sort of look at it and you just think, oh my God, there's absolutely no way this chap is going to be able to walk on this. It's all going to disappear. And he goes off and he has his chemotherapy, has some radiotherapy, and it's an exercise in... in Sort of number one, knowing the pain. You want patients with hematological malignancies around the, the pelvis. You just think there's no way this is going to stay in place. Get the most important thing is that they get the right anti-cancer treatment. And this guy took about two years. This thing consolidated beautifully. The changes you see in his peri in his femoral head are, of course, due to his radiotherapy, not because of any migration of his of his femoral head or protrusion. But now this is an incredibly easy thing to to sort, scrape out the defect, fill it up with cement, and he just had a cemented hip replacement, um, and he's done phenomenally well. Uh, Another example is a lady, um, primary hip replacement 15 years ago, she's only 52 now, but of course, old style poly, that wears out big granuloma behind the acetabulum, um, which wasn't quite appreciated by my colleague who did this. Now, of course, that's doomed to failure, which of course it does. So that... Um, that got revised, missing the x-ray, sorry, of the revision, um, but effectively had a shim up the inside um, and uh, a block of cement, which of course was never going to hold. It got infected, the whole lot fell apart. So um, first stage revision, quite a large periacetabular defect with a discontinuity. And I quite like these, uh, these custom-made um, acetabular uh, reconstructions because it fits the hole beautifully. You don't really have to think about it. All the thought is done beforehand. Um, and so long as you ream where you're supposed to ream, the thing just fits in and it sticks like, um, yes, very well. Um, know your disease. It's a 75 year old prognosis pretty poor so but equally um she's not going to do very well um with with um with a hole in the acetabulum so um 
in our hands here, what we would normally do is reconstruct. There was a, effectively a modified Harrington technique. Um, so block of cements uh, effectively reinforced concrete. And this does very well in the, in the short to medium term, which, of course, a lot of these patients only need mobility for, for a relatively short period of time before their disease um, takes them. It's not just cancer, of course. A 45-year-old gentleman, pelvic trauma, about 20 odd years ago, came off a motorbike and completely destroyed his hip. Um, again, Herefordshire farmer, um, AVN of the femoral head, that disintegrated, disappeared years ago. But very poor bone stock around the acetabulum. Um, and like I say, in in my in my hands, that does that does quite nicely, just with a cone. This is one of my colleague cases. Um, but we are we have a low threshold of just reconstructing these with the pedestal cup because the long-term function of these is is actually now pretty good. Mega prosthesis for the acetabulum are relatively few and far between, um, mainly because of the complication risk. But on occasion, you do get the, right, the, the sort of right patient that does quite well. Again, chondrosarcoma, sarcoma, custom-made periacetabulum. Um, he's now about six years down the line and functions extremely well. It's not as good as a revision arthroplasty, obviously, but um, they're cancer-free and they do they can do quite well with these custom-made uh, periacetabular uh, reconstructions. Um, I think the last one I'm going to tell you about is a sort of tale, a tale of woe, I suppose, is the sort of things that come across your, occasionally come across your, your table. The 45-year-old lady had a Birmingham hip resurfacing at the age of 25. Um, she's now 45 years of age, so 20 years later, and she's got this painful um, pseudotumor around the, uh, around, the, um, around the Birmingham hip resurfacing. This was revised by a colleague of mine. Um, you can almost see, this is in the days probably before when we didn't really understand explants and things like that, but you can almost see where the curved osteotomes have gone around the acetabulum to get the cup out. And of course, it's an uncontained uh, defect. The, the cage, unfortunately, is in the wrong place. So that will migrate very quickly and she never really made it out of hospital. Um, and again, in our hands, just go straight for, for a pedestal cup. The interesting thing is that she's quite short and quite small, so the, the, the off-the-shelf numbers often don't work. Um, but what you see at the top is that actually her bone remodels around it. Um, and she continues to do very well until that got um, loose. Um, and so we revised that impaction bone grafting on the back on the neoacetabulum, shims front and back, um, and quite a large uh, TM cup. Um, with a, still with the, with the original accolade uh, stem. And she's, that's now um, a good few years down the line and presented with a periprosthetic fracture. And again, that's the, the, you know, the cup, the, re, the acetabular reconstruction stayed, stayed intact um, and reconstructed with a revision type um, uh, total hip replacement. So I'll call it a day there. I mean, that just sort of highlights some of the challenges that, that, that you occasionally see um, and some of the options. And, and, I, and I, think, I think the point about it is, is that don't, the, the, the mantra is that there's no one answer to a lot of these things. Often it's a case of just sometimes thinking outside the box and applying the principles of, of, of the right reconstruction for the right defect, I suppose. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Michael. Those are some fantastic cases um, illustrating the principles. Um, I'll, for a point of time, we'll just move on. And um, Duncan Whitehall, well, from, trained in Nottingham University, Bristol, Oxford and Brisbane. Um, he was appointed in 2005 at the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre, and he now leads the, um, the very famous Oxford Bone and Soft Tissue Service there. So he's got huge experience in dealing with uh, large defects. He's going to give us some examples, particularly on the femoral side. So, Duncan, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dominic. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting sort of hearing sort of two previous experts in the field, just sort of highlighting the importance of biology. The fact that, yeah, we might look at x-rays, but actually it's a patient um, behind uh, and they're all very different. And I think that's the key, really. We're not just chucking bits, big bits of metal at patients. We are actually trying to harness their biology. Unfortunately, sometimes it does need it. So I'm really going to sort of should just show some cases. Um, I'm just going to just touch a little bit on the acetabulum just to sort of finish that, but mainly on the femur. So I work in Oxford where we do have a, um, uh, we do have a national um, bone infection unit. And I also do um, tumours and I also do revision arthroplasty. She's already been previously operated on and often um, does have both bone and soft tissue. 
just my disclosures is that ultimately I have freedom to choose any implant system I wanted. So I'm going to show you some implants um, that I use. But yeah, I've just used what I think works. And out of that, I've had educational consultancies with Zimmer and to try and improve um, the use of uh, tumor prosthesis. But there's four things really that I think you need to do this type of work and not go to an early grave. And uh, these are your friends and your teams, as, uh, as we've heard from Phil. You've got to have a good relationship with your microbiologist, your infection team, because yeah, a lot of these cases are always going to have the infection. So yeah, we have to work hand in hand with these guys. I also have a really good relationship. They're on fast dial on my mobile with the plastic surgeons. Really helpful for dealing with defects in the soft tissues or helping you with skin. Really important. And we, on a Wednesday, when we do our major cases, have about four plastic surgeons in adjacent theatres that we can call in. And uh, for the for the fit for the hip, a rectus femoris rotational flap is fantastic in both infection and other etiologies. Duncan, that more my other big trend is where I've been used in the sort of the 2C, 3A, 3B, the cases that you can't just use a hemisphere for, the difficult yeah, uh, bone loss cases. And there, I'm afraid, porous metals has really revolutionized my Duncan. practice. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Are you meant to be screen sharing? We can't see your screen. Oh, do apologize. That's all right. Okay, because I thought I pressed it. Okay. You're a very handsome man, Duncan. <laughs> Is it we're coming now? Okay. Yep. So my friends really are trabecular metal, and we've heard that Phil also talks about this as well, and the fact that this porous metal accepts both soft tissue and bone through its pores, and it really lacks, um, latches on to poor quality bone early with compression screw, and that's been revolutionary in my practice. And then you've heard the other Proposky classification in the femur, and yes, the workhorse is the modular taper fluted stem. But really, when you come down to the significant bone loss in the type four, where I've really found sort of help is the tumor prosthesis with the use of porous metals. Um, again, here at the attachment for the greater trochanter, or even if it's just a soft tissue attachment for the abductors. So I just sort of emphasize sort of a case. This is unfortunately a case that I gathered after going giving a lecture in Ireland. Um, the, patient, the surgeon came up to me and immediately re referred this patient with all the funding. So I couldn't really say no after I sort of uh, talked about this. He'd had a road traffic accident, had an early hip replacement. It then got infected. He then had multiple revisions and ultimately had a triflange, um, expensive implant, but it kept on getting infected and wouldn't settle down. At this stage, that's a soft tissue envelope that you have. You've got to really, with this, after multiple surgeries, take everything out and start again. So all this came and was put in the bin, this 12,000 triflange. And then we, um, we had a spacer put in the acetabulum, but it didn't really settle down. So this is where my microbiology team were good. They sort of cared for the patient. They got another MRI scan, and you could see that I hadn't quite debrided fully some collections in the femur. So again, no, no problems, went back in and did a further debridement of the femur and put some, um, some, some vancomycin beads in the femur as well, and that's what we were left with. So this has had a £12,000 triflange in, and now we're ready after the CRP settles down to put a, a new in. I don't think we need to do triflanges on this. I think this is overkill. Essentially, this is a 3A defect. You still have inferior bone here. There's still some medial bone. There's just a lot of superior bone loss. And that's what you've got to try and put a cup into. A bit, the, the bone is not great. And this is where, yeah, I, like Phil, I found the best porous metal is the tantalum. I think it does stick better, and I think it does encourage bone better. And certainly the revision shells with their modulus elasticity similar to bone, also secondary load bone better. And that's ultimately what you want to do. You don't want to stress shield bone. You want to load bone and get it to come back to life, a la Wolf's Law. And then if you just get this, these struts of trabecular metal into that poor quality bone, you should get that immediate press fit fixation. And as you know, there's lots of different ways of putting these augments. And there's a, 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 an algorithm based on the Proposky 
um, assessment of the x-ray on how you can use these various different augments. Um, but largely it comes down to trial and error in the operating theatre. But what we want to do is just try and, yeah, we do encourage people to sort of follow that algorithm just so that we can try and make it simple and, and uh, efficacy for everyone to do it. But here I just dreamed where I felt the cup should be, got a press fit front to back down at the front at where the cup should be, where, where the acetabulum should be. I put a keystone augment superiorly to keep the cup down. And then we locked it together with a buttress and on the uncontained defect at the back. Um, I'm not going to go too much more detail, but just to emphasize, I'm looking at biology here. I'm not looking at putting a big slab of custom metal to bypass this defect. I'm looking to work within this defect to get the best and most um, highest amount of host bone contact on this trabecular metal implant, whether it's a cup, an augment, or a buttress. And once you get that fixation, you can then load this and you can load it and that will hopefully restore the bone as well, rather than bypassing it that you can unfortunately sometimes do with these big customs. Because you see this custom, it hasn't got any osteo integration at all. So yeah, I'm a big believer like Phil is that yeah, this, this, uh, these porous metals are really helping us in the various different shapes that they come to actually better get fixation within the defect rather than without of the defect. And, uh, and I really very rarely ever sort of, uh, yeah, ever actually use customs. And in this case, with good fixation of the implant, good microbiology, we also brought a plastic flap in as well, I think. We got his infection um, settled down. So I'm just going to go on to the femur now, um, just to emphasize sort of our, our things, the femur, really the big bone loss problems are really in the type 4 femur. And you get these cases, a uh, 54-year-old learning disorder patient, very disruptive. You know she's going to get out of bed as soon as possible after the operation and not any orders. And really, yeah, as Phil said earlier, you could do a very complicated peripacetic fracture reconstruction here, taking all the metalwork out. But you know that actually it's a more simpler option is sometimes just to use a big bit of metal and to use a tumor prosthesis. And that's what we did. In this instance, it was a, uh, a STAMOR actually, and we put a hydroxyapatite um, um, trochanter on, which you can actually attach the GT on. And hopefully that will grow into the uh, hydroxyapatite, because what this is doing is trying to really lash the proximal femur down to the acetabulum to try and make this as stable as possible. The other thing I think that we have nicely now as a modern tool in the 21st century is dual mobility. And I think you can see we've got a dual mobility that I've cemented into the existing cement mantle here. And I think dual mobility really attaching the greater trochanter onto the implant is really helping us in this day and age get stability. And uh, from 20, 30% instability from proximal femurs 20, 30 years ago, we're now in single figures that we're likely to dislocate. So we are seeing improvements and reductions in complications with modern designs of dual mobility and attachments on the GT and careful soft tissue closure over it. So when we've got cases like this, we may fear about using sort of tumor prosthesis. 75, she's had peripacetic fractures between her hip and a knee. She's had multiple platings to revise to try and restore the, the, um, the, 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 the femur. At the moment, it's wobbling. It's, um, it's not, she can't stand on it, and she's been in a wheelchair. And so ultimately, I think she had over 10 um, operations. Um, just for completeness, yeah, we checked for infection, inflammatory markers, and an aspiration were all negative. So, yeah, how can we undertake a, 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 a segmental or a, a tumor prosthesis operation on this, but try and minimize the complications? Because if we get a complication, it could mean a long time in hospital for this patient and could almost be terminal. Um, we've presented on this, and there's been a paper that came out a few years ago, sort of our experience of tumor prosthesis. And I want to re echo what, uh, what Mike Parry said, really, in that what we find in our hospital is that the revision arthroplasty surgeons probably do as many tumor prosthesis as we do in oncology. And really, sort of our practice of using tumor prosthesis has really been taken on um, quite significantly by my arthroplasty colleagues, both in the hip and also in the knee. So, yeah, in this case, we decided to do a total femur. 
And yeah, apart from sort of um, knowing a little bit of anatomy, largely in revision arthroplasty, you can keep on the bone. And as you go down the femur, releasing it, you've got to come across a few vessels like the profunda, which is about two finger breadth below the lesser trochanter. But largely as you go down, you can just take the tissues off the femur, keeping away from the nerve and the, and the femoral vessels. And then when you come to the knee, always resect round the knee in flexion because that allows the popliteal vessels to drop back and you can easily get to the back of the femur and just um, diaphragm through a through geniculus with coming off the popliteal vessels. And it's a relatively safe way of dissecting out the total femur. So in this case, yeah, you can see this is the biology that we took out from this femur. You can see that was never going to heal. There's not much bone there. And it's that appreciation when the biology is poor that I think is really important. And you see, we converted that into a total femur. We've used a dual mobility up here. We've got trochantic attachment onto a trabecular metal plate here. And we've got a modern generation hinge there. So modern implants that can hopefully in this case get a 75 year old lady out of a wheelchair. Yes, okay, she's on a frame, but at least she's mobile. And I think that that is a, a good option when you're at this end stage when you can't um, really get any bone healing because of the biology. But just to emphasize that sometimes the results are much better if the muscles and the, and, and, and the, and the patient are fitter. This is a, unfortunately a younger patient who had a very complex sort of um, infection, a lot of proximal bone loss. Then they had a modular fluted stem reconstruction. Fortunately, the taper was not well fixed in the isthmus and the taper subsided and came out of the knee. And with arthritis in the knee, we ultimately had to do a total femur. But in this case, you can see a much more younger patient, muscles better. With her right femur, you can see that she's walking without any walking aids. And so these actually can. That's actually her left hip, which is weaker than her right. But that's her right total femur, and she's walking with no walking aids. And she's actually got good knee function as well. So depending on the protoplasm of the patient really determines... Um, really what the outcome with these. But these were uh, these no complications with stability and no infection, luckily. So, yeah, I really sort of um, just want to end there because I think we're running out of time. But just really to sort of highlight what my colleagues have said. Yeah, we have got the tools now. Porous metals, tumor prosthesis really can take on some of these really sort of end stage cases. Um, but you need your team approach. You, I've really couldn't do it without colleagues, including microbiologists and plastic surgeons. Thank you very much, Dominic. Well, thanks very much. I, I realise that we've sort of pushed the envelope a bit in the time-wise, but I think the real take-home message has been, I think you summarised up there, Duncan, is teamwork. You shouldn't be doing these things in isolation. We all know that networks are expanding, that we need to get the, the criteria for who you're going to work with. Um, I suppose one thing of interest is, do you think with metastatic work, do you think that can be dealt with purely by an arthroplasty team surgeons, or do you think you always need some oncological type surgeons for dealing with metastatic? And it may well be part of an MDT with pathologists, but do you think that, that they can deal with that? Because the load is going up, and I'm not sure if the, all the hospitals will have an oncological team uh, present at them. I think you make a very good point, Dominic. I think that we did a boost survey of uh, units that have metastatic leads, and, um, and it was less than 20%. So, yeah, all hospitals should have an orthopedic unit largely, but not many actually have anyone with an interest in it. And there's no doubt about it, uh, we can't do it all. We do take on the, the cases that maybe need wide resections, like renal cancers and things like that. But we really do need, I think, our revision hip and knee colleagues to particularly take on, yeah, breast cancer metastasis um, potential. But they should be able to do proximal femurs, I think, as Phil has shown. Um, he's very happy doing it. And uh, I think most revision surgeons now have got some experience. But, yeah, you do. It's a hub and spoke. So I hope you'll deal with your local tumour unit for advice, et cetera, and refer along for the more complex cases. Sounds like something for the BHS and more guidelines by, by that. Well, I, I think we are now just, uh, we're supposed to have taken about 55 minutes and we're at uh, 58. So I, I think we, I'd just like to thank you all. You've all given a, a fantastic uh, overview of managing these big defects. Um, and um, I'm sure the audience are all very appreciative of that. So um, Michael, 
Phil, Duncan, thanks again very much. Really informative. And I think one of the highlights of the, of the series so far. Thank you. Thanks Lovely. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Good night.